Hello and welcome to the Book of Leeds podcast. My name is Cara and I am your host. Welcome to episode 38 of Book of Leaves. Thank you so much for tuning in. It is lovely to have you here. If you are a new listener, you're very welcome. This is a podcast where I keep interviewing people who are doing something good for the planet in some way, shape or form in regards to the environment and we take a leaf from their book to add our own way of eco-friendly living. And in this episode, we are going to be chatting to Dermot Hughes from Forage Ireland. Before we get into that, a quick check in with you. I hope these are doing okay it is a tumultuous time out there um environmentally speaking you know there's good days and bad days and unfortunately in the last few days the eu has passed a cap reform common agricultural agriculture policy which has locked in a lot of intensive farming methods and basically practices where big agri big agricultural business will gain over small farmers and it's quite disastrous because it can't be changed for another seven years. So that is something that has happened in the last few days that really stressed me out, not gonna lie. And with my fellow activists in Animal Rebellion and Extinction Rebellion, we've been trying to come up with ideas to like, you know, mobilise people to contact their MEPs about this. So keep an eye, I guess, on my Instagram, my Twitter, and I'm sharing stuff there, what to do. And if you've been stressed by that or by other news going on in Ireland or across the world, oh, we're all in a very similar storm and just sending out some empathy. I hope you're doing okay. Um, There's good times and bad times. And right now I want to switch it over and let's talk about the positive. And the positive I want to talk about is my interviewee, Dermot. Dermot is a lovely gent who is in Belfast at the moment. I've been wanting to talk about foraging for so long and it's really hard to find someone at this time of year because obviously autumn is when so many things are growing. People are really, really busy. So Dermot was kind enough to give me some time. He and his late wife, Mary, set up a business called Forage Ireland in 2015, I think it was. And before that, Dermot was a geologist. He studied in Trinity. He'd always been big into bird watching and uh, the environment and wildlife. And he had a huge fascination with botany as well. And he ended up working for Ulster Wildlife Trust and setting up Forage Ireland. And we're going to chat about the kind of basics about getting into foraging because I've only gotten into it this summer, really. This year, I've only started growing things and I just, I've lost so much knowledge since being in primary school, being a child, I think, you know, as a, in primary school, you do all these exercises where you put like a tree leaf under a piece of paper and you colour over it with crayon. I don't know, that was like one of the highlights of my art class anyway, but I don't know if you guys did the same thing. And it helped you remember what the tree was as well, that match, you know, that the leaf was matched to. I've forgotten nearly everything. The only thing I can recognise is a horse chestnut. That's terrible. That's so bad. So chatting to Dermot was really fun, learning about different plants. Now, of course, this is a podcast and this is something that you were taking in via your ears, most likely. But I do have a YouTube account as well where most of the episodes this season are going up. Not all of them, but most of them. And this episode, if you hear anything and you're like, oh, I wonder what that plant looks like, go check it out on YouTube. I've time slotted bullet pointed time everything is listed <laughs> I don't know what the word is but there's like time points I'm just gonna go with points for each topic so each flower or food that we spend a chunk of time on I have bullet pointed the time that we chat about that at so you can go find it on the YouTube channel at Book of Leaves podcast and you can see what the flower or the plant or the tree looks like because I've downloaded all the pictures and spent ages editing a YouTube video but if you're already watching on YouTube you'll see them anyway so that's the only thing I really wanted to say before we get into the interview I will let Dermot do the rest of the talking please please as always share this podcast with a friend tell your mom and rate review subscribe and if you can afford to support it on patreon please do or if you would like to support it once off 
buymeacoffee.com forward slash book of leaves is where you'll be able to contribute three euro or six euro or nine euro i don't actually drink coffee though realistically you'll go towards the renewal of the of the website fees but <laughs> it would be appreciated all the same okay here is dermot i will catch you after for some quick show notes i hope you enjoy Dermot, thank you so much for joining me for the Book of Leaves podcast. I am delighted to have you here. I've been looking for someone to chat about foraging for ages. So thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Welcome. Welcome to sunny Belfast. (laughs) It looks so sunny here. I'm just overcast and grey and you've got the lovely sun in your face. So well jealous. Come here. Before we get into foraging, like I like to, with all my podcast guests, get to kind of know them a little bit, in, um, have them introduce themselves to our listeners. So for people listening who may have never heard of Forage Ireland or don't know who you yourself are, can you tell us like where you're from, where you grew up and how we'll lead into how you got into foraging? Okay, well, um, I'm originally from Dawkey in County Dublin. My parents were both from Northern Ireland. But uh, my dad worked in Dublin, so that's where I ended up. And we used to spend a lot of time in the Wicklow Mountains, just going out for walks and things like that on a Sunday afternoon. And my mother was a great blackberry picker and we'd always go blackberry picking in the autumn. So I was always interested in nature and the environment and all that sort of thing. <clears throat> my mother was a, a war baby, so she was on in that whole sort of shtick of sort of make do and mend and everything. So she always sort of, you know, sewed and knitted and made clothes and all that sort of stuff, you know. And then um, I eventually left home and I met my wife in Donegal and we eventually decided she was from Belfast. We decided to settle in Belfast. I was at the time I was working all around Ireland. Then I got a job with the Ulster Wildlife Trust based in County Down. So that made me well and truly rooted in, in Northern Ireland. And I was back close to my own roots and everything as well, which was quite nice. Once we got married, I think we, we always started to get into the, you know, making the bread and making the jam. And I started making homemade wines and things like this. And uh, Mary, my wife, she was a great sewer and knitter as well. She loved playing around with textiles. So about 10 or 11 years ago, we were sort of, I'd, I'd given up my job at that stage. And I was sort of looking around for things to do. And I wanted to stay within the environmental side of things. So I set myself up as a as an eco- ecological consultant, but I also had this notion of trying to teach all these foraging skills to people. So that's where the idea of Forage Ireland came in. We just started then slowly, gradually doing, you know, talks and getting making contacts. I had a lot of contacts in the in the sort of the environmental sector. I sort of used my contacts to sort of just make myself known and what we were doing, and gradually it built up to be, you know, did quite a lot of these things. So we've been doing up up of about 20, 30 events during a year, you know, so we were getting quite busy. Um, Mary died in 2015, so like, I, you know, she was around for five years. I was just thinking about that the other day, and it seemed as if we were doing it together for so much longer than that. But I mean, yeah. it's, it's more or less five years ago when we were together for five years doing it. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm still doing the, the, the pure foraging, so to speak. I'm not doing an awful lot of the textile stuff. But I mean, Mary was doing like she was extending forage to include things like going out and foraging for materials from the tweed factories in Donegal and, uh, you know, charity shops and everything. And then repurposing it all and doing doing some really good, um, clever things with with textiles and, you know, recycling and then selling them for charity and all that sort of crack. You know, it's been really good. I mean, I've always enjoyed it. And what I love about the foraging is that apart from passing on skills to people who find it very interesting, it's also a great way of getting people to connect with nature and getting people to really understand a little bit more, being a little bit more aware of how important the natural world is to all of us, either in terms of recreation, in terms of providing us with food. And ultimately, you know, natural processes are what provide the food for the world. And foraging is sort of like a, a little link in that chain as well. So from that point of view, I find it, you know, very interesting to be able to, you know, communicate that with people. Gradually over the years, I've sort of taken and taken people's names and emails and things like that. And I must have about sort of two and a half thousand contacts on email, you know, that I send out every time. And it's amazing how many people you've actually touched over that time. Yeah. So uh, it's been good, you know. 
It's been, it sounds like it's been absolutely amazing. Yeah, well, the other thing is now that, you know, there are a lot more foragers around. Like when, when we started it, we were really the only people doing regular foraging walks. And now there's quite a few people who are doing it. And I mean, they're a lot more switched on in terms of social media as I would be. So they're, they're getting a lot, of, a lot of business, you know. So it's, it's great to see. Um, the good thing is that, you know, I, I work at the very basic level. So most of the people I deal with are beginners and enthusiasts. Some of the other foragers, they're specialists and they're much more um, maybe after particular things like seaweeds or fungi or something like that. So, um, you know, there's there's room for everybody as well. Yeah, I must say, I can't wait for whenever I get the chance to go up to Belfast next. I'll definitely do some kind of foraging tour. I haven't done any foraging tours at all. And my own foraging experience I think like a lot of Irish people even though I grew up in the countryside consisted only of blackberries you know anything else could have killed me in my like if you don't know do you know what I mean so it's something that I just think I think when we talk about humans being top of the food chain or really intelligent but if you actually left them on the island of Ireland with no supermarkets or shops like how would they actually do you know yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the bottom line is there's not enough out there in the countryside to feed everybody. The environment is just knackered, you know. Blackberries are also only a sort of a short period in the season. So, you, you know, again, if you're if you're just expecting to live off blackberries all year, you'll be struggling, you know. Yeah. But um, but I think blackberries are the best way to start because, you know, if you have blackberries and apples, you can make really good jam from them, you know, and it's it's sort of, as long as you have the apples, you can make any jam sort of pretty idiot proof because the apples help the jam to set, you know, and it, it makes for, it makes for a great way of actually getting people, um, I suppose, started because, you know, it's, you need to have a bit of confidence. As you say, you're worried about things killing you right, left and center, but I mean, there's actually very little out there that could do you any harm. And, you know, the chances of encountering it would be pretty slight. So. You know, it's, it's it really is a case of going for it. That's good to know. So what would be your kind of starting tips for people? I know they might not, there might not be foraging tours people can do for another few weeks or whatever, but any resources or any specific things to look out for to start off? Well, at this time of the year, we're getting sort of out of the main foraging season. I mean, there's maybe a few mushrooms around, but I would always be very wary about encouraging people to pick up mushrooms unless they really know what they're doing. So they would need to be mm. with an expert or they would need to know a fair bit uh, themselves. The one fruit that's still on the go would be the slow, the blackthorn. Um, that's the one that's used for making slow gin. So if you're a bit of an alco, you can always um, go out and buy your gin and then stick the slows into it with some sugar and there's your slow gin. Just leave it for a couple of months. It's very, very easy. Um, the slows are like tiny little plums and they're very very sour very very bitter the only thing you can confuse them with would be the the laurel the big cherry laurel but that's got big big green glossy leaves and the berries don't taste they just don't taste nice whereas the slow berry it just grows in sort of hedgerow bushes and you'd recognize it because it has a sort of it's a purpley bluey colored thing and it's about the size of your I suppose your thumbnail and it's um as I say, very, very sharp, very, very bitter, but you can't really mistake it with anything else. The, le the leaves of, or the branches are very, very spiny as well. So they're coming into their peak now. And if you can find those and make the slow gin, you know, we're very happy. I usually use it sort of medicinally, you know, for, um, you know, just of an evening, like before I go to bed or something like that, because, but if you if you add boiling water, it makes a really nice hot toddy before you go to bed or something like that, just or just to warm you up, you know. Lovely. So uh, that's the way I take it, you know, rather than sort of in a social gathering, because you could quaff an awful lot of it. It's very, <laughs> it is very quaffable, so <laughs> it's you dangerous. Just have to be a bit careful. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so slowberries are coming in to season now, but I guess I know people like foraging wild garlic looks different to garlic that you'd grow at home sometimes so like why why is that well it's a different species of plant completely uh i mean the wild garlic you you harvest the leaves you don't harvest the, the root or the bulb you know like you would in uh, like the garlic I and mean, the the, the, what the cultivated garlic is like a, an onion in the sense that you as i say you use the, the the bulb rather than the leaves 
the wild garlic is a leafy plant and it only comes up in the spring so it's got a very short season um, and also the bulbs are tiny it's not worth sticking them up which is also quite a good thing because you're not destroying the plant you're just you know pruning it effectively by taking some of the, the leaves off there is another plant called the three-cornered leek which is effectively like wild garlic and it looks like a white bluebell and it actually stays growing all year round but it's an introduced species you mainly find it around coastal areas and it's got sort of long bluebelly type leaves but once you pick them and rub them they just smell garlicky so you know you're onto the right thing so anything that really smells garlicky or oniony is probably okay <laughs> <laughs> it's a good test you want to have a good sense of smell um and there's like there's flowers i was doing a sustainable gardening course there oh i can't remember the name of them but it just looked like a wild flower kind of corner of this of this allotment and there were these tiny purple flowers that uh, the teacher Eve was like pick one of those and eat it it'll taste like a cucumber and it's kind of like, ah, and you pick it and it actually, it tastes exactly like a cucumber. It's like being in Willy Wonka or something when you're eating, you know, the chewing gum with the three dinners or something. It was flowers as well, because we often think it's just like berries and like the leaf, leafy greens or something. But you can, you can eat and pick and forage flowers too. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, there, there are quite a lot of garden plants that are, are used, like things like nasturtium flowers and violet flowers and pansies and things like that and there's also some wild ones like um, Himalayan balsam is quite a common plant now along rivers particularly in urban areas and it's it's regarded as a bit of a pest because it, it really takes over the place um, but the flowers are absolutely delicious and they're big lovely big pink lousy flowers that the, the, the bees just absolutely love I always have to work, you know, be careful if you're picking one to make sure there isn't a bee inside it. Oh. But um, it's a great way of actually controlling the plant as well, because if it's if it's invading and if it's increasing a lot, then, you know, if you pick the flowers, then you're not going to sort of, in, you know, increase the seeds and all that sort of thing as well. So it's it's good to eat them. But, you know, they're really tasty, you know, they're really nice. And the flowers, the flowers of the wild garlic are absolutely beautiful to eat as well because they taste of onion rather than garlic. You know, they're really sort of like hot, pungent, oniony flavour, whereas the the garlic leaves are garlicky. You know, yeah. But it's it's amazing how you can try these things. I mean, there there are there are some poisonous plants that you have to be aware of, but I mean, it's easy enough to remember those. I mean, things like foxglove. You don't want to touch foxglove. Well, you can touch foxglove, but you don't want to eat it. There's things like hemlock which could be confused with some of the carrot family, things like, you know, um, cow parsley and stuff like that. It'd be good if you if you knew hemlock, but I always sort of, I rarely ever find it on my foraging walks. But once you get to know hemlock, like hemlock smells horrible. And most of the, or all of the plants that you're going to eat usually smell nice. And, you know, if you, if you rub them and crush them, they actually smell aromatic or they smell Kirby or something like that mm. um, whereas some of the poisonous ones you know are pretty rank you know so you know that that's a great help as well um, I mean it's, it's not a it's not an absolute rule of thumb but certainly if you want to avoid eating hemlock anything that looks anything that you're worried about and it smells disgusting well just leave it alone but if it smells really nice and herby you should be fine you know yeah but yeah, I mean, the, the, the cow parsley and the hogweed do look a bit like the elder, except they draw up from the ground. They're just single stems and they have, they're what they call the, the umbellifers, the umbrella family. The, the, you know, the tops of the plants look like little umbrellas um, because they have a, a, like a flat top and then all these sort of spines coming up from the, the centre. And, uh, you know, that's, the, that's their characteristic. And they're, they're all members of the carrot family. Um, do you ever get people questioning kind of what it what is the point in foraging if you can just go to a supermarket and get all the food that you need like what what do you say to them i mean as i was saying earlier i think one of the nicest things about foraging is it puts you in touch with nature it makes you appreciate the seasons it makes you appreciate seasonality and if if that's the case that really helps in terms of your choices and what you buy so that you know you don't buy strawberries in the middle of winter because you know you know they've got to be flown in from somewhere where they maybe have been grown under you know hot lamps and things like that so you know the, the, the actual global footprint of buying stuff well out of season is quite high 
So, you know, if you, if you, if you learn that message from foraging, that's pretty good for a start. Um, the other thing is there, it's, um, it's very good because it, it supplements your diet with a lot of wild things. I mean, a lot of the, the sort of, you know, the, the nutrition experts uh, extol the virtues of raw food uh, up to a point, obviously. But I mean, you know, raw ingredients are often better for you than cooked ingredients. So a lot of the a lot of the spring foraging, for instance, would be leafy stuff, which would be mostly eaten raw, uh, you know, in, in like in salads or garnishes and things like that. Um, so you're getting all the goodness of them and you're also getting all the various bacteria and yeasts and things like that that naturally occur and stuff like this. You're probably also getting all the diesel fumes and everything, so I mean, you have to be careful where you're picking. But I mean, you know, all things considered, and we have a wet climate, so everything gets nicely rinsed anyway. But, um, you know, if you're picking stuff from a, a wild location, it's going to be clean and good for you, you know. Um, the other thing as well is that, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of overlap between foraging for food and foraging for herbalism. And mm. an awful lot of the species do have very good herbal remedies as well. At the same time, it's a bit like, um, you know, preemptive stuff. Like if you, if you take a nice balanced diet, in general, it's going to keep you reasonably healthy. If you, if you do the same with forage food, like if you, if you have a certain amount of forage food in your diet, you know, that's bound to keep you reasonably well. Yeah, and far, forage foods are whole foods, you know, so ho whole foods as opposed to processed foods is kind of like the key. You know, sure um, me, I'm sort of 103 years old, you know. <laughs> well, you're looking well, Jesus. I'll have what you're having. All the slow gin. It's the slow gin, isn't it? <laughs> it is, yeah. Slow food, slow gin. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, yeah, so it's good for you. It gets you back in touch with nature. Um, the food is typically good for you. And yeah, herbalism is something that I would love to learn about more. Um, of course, you know, keeping in check with your doctor and everything is important. But there is so many things in nature that can help with like the mildest things like headaches or any kind of pains or nausea and, and stuff like that. Um, there's just so much to know. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I have the advantage of knowing the plants and knowing the species and being able to identify the species. And I think that's where it can become very daunting for somebody who's a beginner because, you know, there's so many plants out there and trying to actually decide which ones you want is very, very difficult because you know you have to go to the process of identifying it first and being sure that that's what it is mm -hmm. and then you know figuring out what you can do with it you know i suppose going from the other direction uh, a lot of people would look at a book you know they they have a headache and they go and look at a herbal book and they say right what's good for headaches and it says something like fever few you know and then they go out and look for fever few well they have no idea whether you know where it grows uh, what sort of habitat it's in, what time of the year does it appear and all that sort of thing. So, you know, that's why, again, you, you know, you want to start off with the easy things. Like, I mean, cow parsley grows everywhere in Ireland, like every roadside, every woodland edge and all that sort of thing. It grows, it's abundant. Uh, and as long as you're out sort of from March to June, I suppose, that's whenever it's at its peak. Um, you know, you, you can easily identify it, you can easily get to know it and, you know, smell it and rub it and, and get to know it, you know, and then once you're there, you know, you always know cow parsley then, so you'll always be able to find it. But it just takes that one experience of, of really getting to know it and then you'll always know it. And I think smell is a very is a very good um, sense as well. You, you remember smell very well and I usually find that's a great way of helping people to identify stuff. But you don't get that from books. You only get that from, you know, personal experience. Yeah. Because you, you know, books don't don't really register smells. You know, there's no smell o vision in books or websites. You know. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Oh well, that's true. <laughs> you never know. But, but yeah, I mean, that's you know, as I say, if you if you start off with the easy stuff, and then then you can get on to things like mushrooms and hard stuff. You know, but things like the how parsley, things like the slowberries the blackberries, the raspberries, the strawberries, and the nuts, the various things like the beech nuts and the hazelnuts, um, and a lot of the leafy stuff. If you live near the coast, uh, you get a lot of good um, good edible plants as well along the shoreline, um, things like RH, uh, things like um, sea beet. 
sea beet's a wonderful thing it's, it's like spinach but it grows all year round it's lovely glossy leaves and it grows all year round and it's it's a superb um substitute for spinach so you never have to again buy those bags of spinach and leave them rotting in the, the back of the fridge yeah you know? oh god stop there's always a few leaves that just make a bit of like yeah they're just wilting away um yeah and if you pick if you pick it you're kind of more you're more inclined to like eat it that day and like appreciate it i found that just from starting to grow things like just when you see a seed germinate you're you appreciate like there's apples grown in the garden of my rented house here and i i keep going out every day and checking the apples and then when i eat them it's like it's just so much more enjoyable than a supermarket apple i'm getting way too excited over this <laughs> um well as you say you really appreciate it because you've you've invested in it to a yeah. certain extent you know rather than just invested money you've invested time and energy and and uh sweat and tears you know yeah yeah and walked it's all the same way with foraging. yeah with foraging mm-hmm. you're you're you know you're out there and you're you're you know you're getting stung by nettles and snagged by blackberries and stuff like that you know so you've you've earned it yeah definitely um are there any kind of patches that you should kind of avoid like what if i don't know if you're if there's a it's a council area that may might be sprayed with pesticides or if you don't know if the neighboring farms are using chemicals like is there a way you can kind of tell that uh of any areas that might have fruitful food but uh you should avoid yeah well i mean i would do quite a lot of picking and stuff and, and also do foraging walks like in parks and forests and stuff like that which are public areas i mean the main thing i would worry about would be dog poo and all that sort of thing because you know if you if you think of anywhere near a car park anything at sort of ground level is going to be contaminated um for the at least 100 meters around the, the car park you know because the dogs just immediately get let out of the car and away they go and that's the first thing they usually do so um you know beyond that you just have to be careful i suppose at the edges of paths because again dogs mainly um and also stuff gets trodden and a bit muddy and stuff like that um as far as other contamination is concerned obviously if you're on the seashore or close to rivers you want to be careful of water pollution and if you're picking aquatic plants um like watercress and things like that you have to be careful of what the water quality is like uh, along the, the coast as well you have sewage outfalls and you have pollution points along the shore um, but mostly if you're talking about you know plants growing up at the tide line or above then you're pretty safe seaweeds maybe you have to be a little bit more careful and shellfish and stuff like that as far as other plants are concerned just in your general neighborhood yeah i mean they generally suggest that you don't pick beside main roads and busy roads because of all the particulate pollution from car exhausts and stuff um but i mean your average little back road or boring should be fine um and i suppose yeah i mean if the farmer's been spraying his fields with slurry and stuff like that nowadays the, the slurry spreading is injected more into the ground it's much more they used to sort of have it going everywhere you know it was just like a, a fine mist which drifted all over the place so um nowadays most hedgerows are reasonably free from that sort of contamination and arable fields which would be sprayed you know like wheat fields and potato fields and everything which are sprayed abundantly yeah you probably want to sort of steer clear of them but um no generally speaking it's just it's it's common sense you know like it's you just it's like the covid thing you know you have to look out for yourself and you have to take your own precautions and if you do pick stuff from a polluted river you know i mean you should you should know better yeah yeah maybe that's not the selection working away then (laughs) (laughs) Um, i was just going to say about the various different sorts of foragers you know because i mean i'm uh i'd call myself like a basic forager like i don't really do anything too exotic and i would supplement things like i'd I'd throw stuff like cow parsley leaves into soup and stuff like that um you know wild garlic and stuff and add nettles to soup and everything i would um use sea beet as a veg and stuff and i'd make the jams and the wines and everything so that's that's sort of the bulk of what i would do but there's other foragers who are much more foodies and they'd be much more sort of instagram type people uh i mean i can't even 
think of the sorts of things that they would do but i mean i'm aware of a few few people who do post on instagram and their stuff is absolutely amazing uh and you know their knowledge is really good but i mean they're coming much from a more from a foodie background whereas i'm coming more from a i suppose an environmental background and then i suppose the third type of foragers would be the the commercial foragers and you know they would they would actually be going out to collect stuff for restaurants and for um commercial ventures and stuff like that and you know that's okay up to a point but i think it can be unsustainable if it's not done properly so i mean responsible foragers will not overpick that's actually what i was going to ask you next yeah how do you know how much to pick so that there's enough for other foragers or more specifically that local wildlife isn't running short because i've seen yeah some photographs of like a mushroom like path after being decimated from people from a restaurant or i don't know yeah so what is there is there rules or kind of around it or basic guidelines well yeah i mean it's like i mean there's all these sort of various you know voluntary codes and things like that i'm not aware of anything written down i mean there was always a thing we were reared with called the countryside code and it it was a sort of like a general you know philosophy that you you know you didn't you didn't wreck the countryside after you and you picked your litter up and you didn't leave it behind and you you know you didn't leave your disposable barbecue there to burn the countryside down and you closed gates and you did all these sorts of things so i mean that type of attitude you know if you extend that to foraging yeah i mean you're talking about not picking everything that you see there would be issues particularly in, in britain with mushrooms where people go out and collect mushrooms for the restaurant trade but some of them would go out and just pick everything they see and leave it up to the 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 restaurant to decide what ones they want and all the rest would be thrown away it's like a buy buy catch sort of situation you know where you go and fish with trawler nets and you you know everything you know you're fishing for a particular species and all the other stuff is just dumped you know that's that's not of interest but it's usually dead and it's of, of no use then you know so it's a very wasteful and extravagant sort of way of doing things um if you're picking a lot of stuff like for if you wanted to make like blackberry jam or something you're never going to pick all the blackberries there are you know you're never going to get near half of them because they're way deep in the bush or away up high and that sort of thing the classic thing would be the, the elderberries because uh if you go and look at an elder tree you know you'll 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 go in the in the early summer and pick the elder flowers for making your elder flower cordial and your elder flower champagne etc etc you know you'll see that sort of higher up the tree there's lots of elder flowers still there you can't reach them so in the autumn then the elderberries develop on those flowers that have left been left behind and a certain proportion of them will sort of bend down with the weight they'll come down and, and be within picking distance so you'll pick those but there'll always still be some up near the top of the tree that they're left for the birds so in situations like that i don't think there's ever any sort of issue about uh, about over picking i've seen patches of wild garlic which have been sort of trashed but usually they're in, in sort of areas where there's been a hell of a lot you know and it's it's only a small proportion but i think if you find something scarce find something that there isn't very much of you just don't want to pick more than a couple of bits of it you know you just want to be careful because there's probably a reason why there isn't very much of it you know maybe it's just a rare plant or it's a it's just rare in that particular area so you don't want to really jeopardize its existence by picking everything you see and i mean that is the case with mushrooms like if you go into nowadays if you find field mushrooms that's quite a rarity but you know you might find a big flush of mushrooms in a field and the temptation is to go mad and pick it all and preserve some and make soups and everything but again you always want to leave some not necessarily for other people but at least so that they can produce spores and regenerate you know and they can spread and all that sort of thing you know so it, again like the health and safety side of things it, it is all about common sense and just not overdoing it you know because it's you know otherwise it's, it's greedy and unsustainable yeah um i think there's probably parts of the world like particularly close to cities and urban areas where people do a lot of foraging or maybe they do a lot of foraging there will be certain areas that be under pressure but i mean for most of the things i don't think there's really an issue of overdoing it you know because there's always there's always plenty of things that people won't be able to reach or they won't be able to to get at you know yeah 
it kind of works itself out that way when the berries are all at the top of the trees and stuff but yeah leave some for the birds and the hedgehogs too um what are any kind of basic tools that you need if you go out foraging can you do you pick with your hands do you need a like a clippers um and how when you pick them up is putting them in like a plastic bag better or a basket or like what's so what kind of the basic 101 tools (laughs) well for for blackberries my go-to tool is a you know milk container like a plastic milk bottle like a one liter or two liter milk bottle with the if you cut the top off it but leave the handle on it you you, it's it's a fantastic uh, holder for for the blackberries and like a two liter container will hold like a kilo of blackberries so it's quite a lot so it gives you an idea of how much you're actually getting Uh, and then you, you know if you pick more than one of those you can decant it into a bucket or something like that but if you use a plastic bag for picking blackberries, you're onto a loser because it's always going to get torn and all that sort of thing. But I mean, any container is great, but I love the, the idea that, that using the milk carton because you're reusing something that's you're going yeah. to be thrown out eventually anyway. You're better off not using plastic bags. Plastic bags are obviously dead handy, but if you can use paper bags, I mean, that's a bit better because plants, um, you know, particularly things like mushrooms, they don't they don't sweat in the bags. Uh, and, the, you know, it's, it's just better you know sometimes when I'm going out I put a hat out like I wear a hat and I can use that for if I find anything I can use it you know because otherwise it's I'd ram stuff into pockets you know so if I'm out for a walk I'd be ramming my pockets full of wild garlic or something like that but if you collect and if you find mushrooms you know you want to treat them carefully so rather than always be carrying bags and things with me if I'm just out for a walk I'd wear a hat and if if I do come across something you can just pop it in the hat so I carry it that way. Brilliant. So, so cool. it's coming into winter season now. I'll be out wearing my hat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very and, good. I mean, you know, the classic foraging basket as well is fine, but it's a bit naff, you know, and also, you know, you want to be sure of what you're getting. Like if it was going to pick apples or something like that, I'd maybe bring a basket. But most leafy things, you're better off having bags because you may be picking three or four different types and want them for different different purposes you know obviously if you want to pick nettles for a nettle soup you need you need gloves uh, or you know maybe a pair of scissors or something like that uh, you can you can pick nettles with your hand as long as you pinch them very tight and you avoid getting stung but generally speaking it's a lot easier with gloves than yeah using a, using a bag then you know um but yeah i sometimes bring a walking stick as well because you know with a you know with a curved top on it because it's good for reaching up to branches um it helps your balance if you're walking over pretty rough ground or if you want to test that that swampy bit isn't six foot deep you know sometimes i bring a nutcracker with me if i find hazelnuts i can crack them open to see if there's anything in them and uh, there are certain plants that you need to dig up like pig nut which is a it's a little member of the carrot family and when you dig down you find a little nut about the size of a hazelnut in the soil and they do say that if you're picking mushrooms you should cut them rather than pull them up out of the ground because if you pull them up that damages the whole plant but i there's the jury's out on that i don't know if that's a big issue but you know some people do like to cut the mushrooms so you bring a sharp knife with you at the same time as long as you have big pockets you'll be fine you know you can usually get most stuff and fit them in pockets yeah and that's normally the way I operate you know it's only when I'm going out for a you know actually taking people on a foraging walk that I would actually have the paraphernalia with me and just sort of partly to look the part so that when people are trying to find me in the car park to meet me <laughs> I'm, I'm the geezer with the hat yeah. and looking like he's been dragged through a bush backwards you know <laughs> sticking some extra twigs and twigs in your jacket just for the image but normally if you see Dermot walking around Belfast in his hat with a walking stick you think there's just Dermot walking around but no he's wa- full equipped <laughs> for his foraging experience that's yeah. brilliant <clears throat> the other thing about stuff that you you could do with it would be books and I've got you know I've got sort of built up a library of books you can work with like uh, the internet and websites and things like that, but it's very difficult to scroll your way through stuff on the internet unless you have a fair idea what you're after, you know. It's good for information, but it's not very good for identifying stuff. There there are foraging books that have, like there's one here called Food for Free, and it's, um, sorry, battered version, but it's got lots of pictures in it and like drawings and things. And so it, it gives you an idea of what the plant looks like. 
uh, it's not the best identification book, but it, it's, it, it tries that line between the actual foraging and what the plants are good for and actually identification. What you really could do with, you know, a good identification book as well. I mean, there's you know, one of my flower book is, but if you get a reasonably good flower identification book, that helps to that helps you because it just gives more information and helps you to avoid confusion with poisonous species. And you know, for mushrooms, for instance, you really need to have a, a good mushroom identification book or books, as the case may be. Yeah. And like, you know, if nothing else, they're beautiful things to look through, you know, but they give you encouragement and they give you the the, the, the tools to to learn. And uh, I mean there's there's a couple of Irish ones as well. There's one there's one called Wild and Free, and that's actually written by a couple of Irish people, so that's you know specific for Ireland. That's cool to know, yeah. A couple of seaweed books as well, um, which are, are you know Irish authors because most of the books that you buy are like based on Britain or Britain and Ireland, so there's a lot of stuff that you might get in Britain that you wouldn't get here. So you know if you go looking for a sweet Sicily or something like that, you'd be hard pressed to find it in Ireland. Yeah. And if you're a total beginner, like I'm a total beginner to identifying anything at all, even I've forgotten trees even, you know, I remember like what an oak leaf looks like and a horse chestnut, but anything else I just forgot from primary school. So what I've started doing is like literally my garden has uh, like the landlord keeps it in great. There's loads of bushes and flowers. So I've started just yeah. by going out there. Find, like taking a photograph of the leaf and, and like the stem and then coming inside and researching it that way and then when I see that same like we have a Japanese maple in the garden so now when I go out and I see other Japanese maples it's like oh that's the exact same so I find that instead of like reading a whole book and trying to remember it all if you go out and you find something and take a photo and then bring it back to the book kind of like see what's around you first and then then identify it that's what ha- that's what helped me anyway com- coming f- to this at a complete like <laughs> zip zip zero background kind of thing but that but that's exactly how i started you know by by i didn't have a, you know there was no phones in those well there were telephones but there were no mobiles, no mobiles yeah so you didn't um so you just picked the leaf and brought it home and hoped that it was still sort of presentable by the time you got home and then you look through your books where you pick the flowers and you, you again you stuffed them in your pocket and brought them home and identified them that way or yeah, else you brought your books out into the field and did it that way as well but you know some of the books are quite big and bulky so it's handy enough to just have something where you can collect the plants and bring them back home and then you know it's it's the easiest way of remembering stuff it's a bit like you know whenever it, you know at school when you have to learn something you learn it much more if you write it down so you know, it's, it's just that extra little bit of time spent on it is enough to get it into your head mm-hmm. and repetition as well, you know. So I mean, when you're on your five kilometer restricted walks, I mean, you know, you, you just it's plenty of time to just sort of pick a bit of this and pick a bit of that and learn it. And the repetition, you'll, you'll remember it, you know, and extend that to flowers as well as trees. So you, you pick it up very, very quickly. Yeah, well, I'll link I'll link the books that you mentioned in the show notes so that people can find them if they're looking for them, and I'll link some other foraging because I know people probably won't be able to anyone in Dublin won't be able to get to Belfast for a while, so I'll link some foragers around Ireland for hopefully some upcoming tours that they might do, or even like early spring things will be starting up again. I imagine. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, there are some foragers. I I don't know really. If there are foragers actually in Dublin, I'm sure there are. But I know of one in on in Hoth. Her name's Nicole. I follow her on Instagram. She was actually talking about the three, the three. What's it called? The three pointed leak. Oh, I'm after forgetting already. Yeah, three cornered leak. Three cornered. <laughs> three pointy Cara oh my god what am I for so the three cornered leak yeah and I remember looking at that on her story so she's the only one I know of so far in Hoth but I know there's loads in Wicklow there's a Facebook page called Foraging Northern Ireland and they that's just it's just basically a community that has grown up of people who are just interested in foraging and want to sort of compare notes and then you know out of that they've had a few foraging walks I've been on a couple of them as well you know it's just people learning off each other and as long as nobody's really worried about health and safety and you know risk assessments and all that sort of crack and litigation and what have you you know you should be able to get away with it no bother 
I mean, yeah. I have to have public liability insurance for my walks and things. Um, but, you know, push comes to shove. If somebody sued me for something, I'd probably be ruined anyway, you know. <laughs> Don't be suing Dermot, you guys. Oh, Jesus. Um, but so once you forage food, like sometimes, you, you know, your fridge might already be full or you're not going to, you might not eat it all in one day there's so many things that you can do you know like making jams or making soup and batch freezing it and stuff or fermenting i think you guys you've got lo- you have some recipes on your website and um, that people can look up but i guess that's be- pretty much what people do and drawing and drawing food as well so you've drawing fermenting making jams or alcohol to kind of make them last the winter anything else well it's, it is like an extension of gardening gardening quite often you have gluts of things you know everything comes at once so you have all your tomatoes all ripen at the same time so you know that's when you make tomato ketchups and you make chutneys and stuff like that to preserve it to make it last as you say so it's the same with foraging that you know you can you can choose to just stick with the season and just use that plant fresh whenever it's growing or you can preserve it now not everything is preservable but a lot of the herby things even things like wild garlic i mean you can you can freeze wild garlic you do it with mint as well you can you can just freeze it in ice cubes or something like that you can um, make as i say make the jams and make the wines and stuff like that that really makes it it last you know and particularly when they come in such a big rush things like rose hips you know i mean you, you know rose hips are so valuable because they have so much vitamin c and everything uh, so i mean you can make your rose hip syrup and that'll keep for a good long time. I've got jams that are perfectly fine after five years, six years. Same with wines. You know, they they probably age well, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, slow gin is slow gin that I haven't opened yet that I keep forgetting about. You know, it's sitting there for a few years. A few of them have escaped my attention. So, yeah, so there's, you know, it's it's a nice aspect of it is that whole pr- preserving and keeping things you know very yeah there's there's loads of options and there's loads of websites and books out there to help and, and online tutorials as well youtube it can be really helpful for this kind of stuff um i think we've covered so much there around foraging um if in doubt i guess use common sense and you know always be sure of what you're picking um is there anything else you want to mention before we go i don't really think so i mean i suppose as i was saying in the introduction there about myself and mary whenever we started it off it wasn't just about food it was about lots of other st- stuff that you can forage for like textiles and secondhand stuff and everything i mean to me foraging is all about that whole thing of just making use of other things yeah. that are lying around the place uh i mean allotment people people who work and allotments are brilliant foragers because you'll always see you'll always see them you know making things like compost heaps out of old pallets and stuff and you know they never buy anything when they can they can forage or all that whole thing of like beach combing and to me that's all foraging as well you know it's you're just basically looking around seeing what's available and using anything that nobody else is using or that that's not really important for anything else's well-being you know and just yeah. using it yourself so <clears throat> I think it does cover a multitude of, of sins, you know. Yeah, you can be a forager charity shopper, you know. You don't need to be knee deep in, in a bush whacking it with a walking stick to be classified forager. Because the planet needs that. Like, the planet is in god awful dire state that we all unfortunately know about. Well, we don't all know about, but. It's not going to solve the world's problems, but um, I think it's going to. It's going to help you personally and it's going to help you really appreciate nature and wildlife and seasons and everything like that and it'll, you know you can really look at david attenborough films and feel a little bit better yeah no. <laughs> you're doing something about it no i feel so guilty yeah definitely exactly that is such a lovely note to end on dermot thank you so so much i really appreciate it thank you well thank you yeah that was great i enjoyed it Now, I hope you all feel armed and ready enough to go out into the wilderness with a cane and a cap and you are ready to go forage some food. There's some food that's available all year round and yeah, find yourself a book or there's some really, really great uh, Facebook groups you can join as well. I will link them in the show notes and um, there are some other accounts to follow. So depending where in the world or the country you are, I should say. I haven't really looked beyond Ireland. I don't know when we're going to be able to leave Ireland anytime soon, but there's some really uh, good foragers that you can follow depending on where you are. And if they're in your locality and, you know, 
lockdown eases up a little bit, they might start doing socially distant walks or classes again. So I'll list a few of those here. So if you're in Wicklow, there's a good few. There is Blackstairs Eco Trails, which is a beautiful place all about ecotourism. And there's a lady there called Mary who hosts foraging tours sometimes. There is also Wicklow Wild Foods, which is run by Geraldine, obviously as well, based in Wicklow. Then in Dublin, we have Hoth Foraging run by Nicole Dunn. So you can go out to Hoth and have a little foraging tour along the coast and find some coastal treats. There is a woman in Northern Ireland called Claire McQuillan who runs a lot of talks as well and, and walking tours. And her account is very much a beautiful visual foodie account. Uh, Wild Food Mary, that's another woman called Mary in Offaly who also hosts talks and workshops and check out their website as well. And in Mayo, I think they are, there's this couple called Superfolk. They are designers, they do like eco-friendly interior designs, but they also do foraging as well. Last but not least, we have Hips and Haws Wildcrafts run by Courtney. They're also based in Wicklow. So yeah. I am pretty sure there's something else I'm supposed to say, but I can't remember what it is. But yeah, everything that we chatted about will be linked in the show notes. Anything that I forget to mention will also be linked in the show notes, uh, which you'll find in full on the website, bookofleathpodcast.com. And yes, it is going to be Halloween this weekend. So for anyone in Ireland, anyone across the world, I hope you have a very happy, 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 happy Halloween, a happy Samhain and light some candles let the spirits cross over in peace Mwah. and yeah stay safe wash your hands wear a mask go out have a look in your garden and see if you can identify the plants or on your street or in your local park and let me know let me know if, as well if there's any other foragers or you yourself are a forager let me know and i'll include you on the website after and yeah please 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 share this episode Let me know what you think. Get in touch if you have any requests or suggestions for future episodes and support it on Patreon or Book of Leaves if you can. Okay, that's it. Have a nice Monday. Talk to you in two weeks. Bye.